Air Supply is one of the world's most enduring rock and roll groups. The Aussie band has sold over 40 million albums worldwide. Founders Russell Hitchcock and Graham Russell have written and performed countless love songs. Russell and Graham genuinely enjoy working together and have done so for over four decades. Well, Russell Hitchcock, how good is this? 47 years of air supply. In fact, it just had its birthday not long ago, didn't it? That's correct. May the 12th is the day I met Graham Russell in the rehearsals for Jesus Christ Superstar. So it's been a long time, nearly 50 years where I've been for. You think of those almost 50 years, that's a lot of songs. I think, what, 17 studio albums and yes. countless concerts all over the world. Yes. Uh, well, it's only when you do things like this and, and speak to you guys that you get a chance to actually stop after we finished this and, and look back and say, wow, you know, we did that then. And, um, you know, obviously we've had a lot of hits all over the world. We, I think we've released probably, including uh, compilation albums, probably 50 albums. Because the music's so good, and I'm not being braggadocious, uh, people want to hear it. And they, they continue to come to shows all over the world. And uh, we're still doing it at a great level and still enjoying it. Jesus Christ Superstar, 1975. You were both in the chorus back then, weren't you? Yes, uh, we were both very green to the business. Graham had actually been supporting himself as a singer-songwriter, but I'd never been in any kind of uh, show business environment. And I was kind of nagged into going along to, to the uh, auditions. And luckily enough, I was chosen after two or three tries and... Uh, as they say, the rest is history. What's so interesting, Russell, is that you and Graham, you just kind of clicked instantly, didn't you? It was this extraordinary, immediate bond. It was, uh, and I think, as I said, because we were both very green to, to theatre, especially, there were a lot of people that had been in the previous couple of productions uh, that knew everything. There are a lot of what I call them now professional auditioners where they come up to you and try and get in your head and say, I wouldn't sing that if I were you, you know, blah, blah. And uh, so we kind of gravitated to each other quite, uh, you know, spontaneously. And of course we had the, the luxury of both being, you know, I'm, I'm Australian, he's English, talked about, you know, our upbringings and, and our love of the Beatles. And we'd both seen the, them in 64 in England and Australia respectively. Uh, there was a lot of stuff going on that was, uh, made an immediate connection for us. I mean, it was overwhelming for the probably first six months for me. I mean, I worked in an office before Superstar, so getting into the discipline of 60 people on stage being where you were supposed to be at, at the proper time and, um, you know, singing the parts correctly and interacting with everybody. I mean, I'm not an actor, certainly. And uh, it was all a big lesson for us. But after about six months, I got into the, to the groove of, you know, the show. And I also was lucky enough to, um, to understudy John English and Trevor White. Wow. Uh, so I got to hang out with those guys a lot. And uh, John especially was very kind to me. Um, well, Trevor was too, but I spent a lot of time with John uh, because it got to the point where he would say, uh, I'm going to be sick on Thursday, uh, <laughs> just to give me a heads up, you know. So because the first time I played... Uh, the role of Judas I was backstage at the half and the stage manager came and said you know you're you're on as Judas and I totally freaked out and um so I got into my costume and I was back backstage waiting for the curtain to open and the the announcer said uh the role of, of Rus uh, Jesus Judas in the second half will be played by Russell Hitchcock and it was like you know. <laughs> so um it was a kind of Trial by fire, but uh, yeah. I got through it. And I was I was lucky enough to do the to his do his role about forty times. I think. Think of the name Air Supply. Is this right that Graham kind of had this vision, this dream, and that's where the name kind of popped into his head? Yes, that's that's absolutely true. We were trying to think of a name, and we in fact we involved the cast in Superstar to see if anyone could come up with a name, and they all none of them took us seriously, which really you know made me very angry. But anyway. Uh, Graham came to rehearsals or the show at some point and said, uh, I had a dream last night about a billboard with lights flashing around it and it said air supply in the middle. And I thought, good enough for me, you know. 
There's something about Graham. I remember an interview with him several years ago where he talked about being almost psychic. Is that right? He's had that ability for a long time. In fact, we both went to see a psychic and she said that, uh, told me that, that your career will be bigger than you could ever imagine. Um, and at that point, you know, we were in Superstar, uh, planning on touring Australia and New Zealand, and that was it. So, and, you know, his instinct for songs sometimes, uh, he says to me, I've got an idea, I'll go home and do this and play it to you tomorrow, what do you think? And it's always, from in my mind, fantastic. So he's got some... Uh, I don't know, entree into whatever world there is up there that feeds songwriters great songs. Well, he's also a great observer of people. I mean, he spends a lot of time, you think he's off the clock somewhere in a zone, but he's he's always checking things out around him. And uh, and he said it on a few occasions. One of the other things about Graham is he'll never tell you a specific for a song. Where did you get that from? Was it about so-and-so or this person? He goes, I'm not going to tell you. Um, it may or may not be, but he's a great observer, and I've noticed that uh, of him forever. Um, but, and also, when he's on, when he's travelling with us, uh, if he's on a plane with me or or the or tour bus or something, he's always got his iPad out and a set of headphones, and he's writing something down backstage before the shows. He's always playing guitar. Um, you know, we usually have a couple of hours between sound check in the show he's always in his dressing room playing something and and uh on stage the band one of the guys in the band will play a chord and he'll stop and he'll go what is that what chord is that that sounds good you know he's very uh obsessed in a great way with with his craft and with writing songs Nineteen seventy six, lost in love, and it becomes a monster hit. We'd done superstar, went on the road immediately, and I don't know whose attention that came to. I, when I first heard it, when Graham played it to me with played it to me with just him singing and and guitar, I said, "This is a hit, you know, it's going to be monstrous." And of course, it was. Uh, changed our lives in Australia a little bit, not too much, because obviously, uh, if you recall the. The, the live scene in Australia at that point was very rock and roll and very, uh, you know, pub oriented and, uh, you know, ACDC, Midnight Oil, the Radiators, etc. cetera. Um, so it was very hard for us to get a look in, but thankfully uh, radio stations and particularly the TV shows, Countdown, Molly Meldrum was instrumental in, in recording us as well as he did. Um, Flashes, Ray Burgess, uh, another show that we did frequently. That kind of support was, um, you know, unbelievable for us. And then minutes later, you find yourself opening for Rock and Rod Stewart. Now, if that's not a wow moment in your early years, I'm not sure what is. It was unbelievable. I mean, if you consider that myself had never been in music before, we did a year and a half, nearly two years of Superstar. About, I don't know, a couple of months later, we opened three or four shows for Rod in Australia. And after the second show, we were asked to go to the US to, to open his North American tour, which was 50 dates all over North America. Um, you know, to say that was overwhelming is, mm. is an understatement because we, you know, our heads were spinning initially from the Lost in Love success, but uh, being able to, to open for a guy like that was out of this world. What was he like? Was he a, a really nice man? He was. I mean, he is. Uh, we didn't spend a lot of time with him. The, my greatest memories of him were we flew into uh, Los Angeles on the 4th of July, 1977, and we arrived at night and we went straight to the studio he was recording at a very famous studio called Cherokee Studios in Los Angeles. Yes. I came outside the studio and said, welcome, you know, come in and have a glass of champagne with us. We're in the middle of recording whatever it was. Um always treated us with, with on the road with kindness and respect. Um, anything you need, you know, just let our guys know. Uh, and as I said, we didn't see very much of him. We hung, hung out a lot with his band, another great bunch of guys. Mm. Obviously, you know, he, he's one of the greatest rock stars of all time. 
and continues to sell out wherever he goes. Um, and I love the guy to death. I, I just uh, I can't thank him enough. And also uh, as a side issue from actually getting to open for him, we had the chance to watch him perform every night for, for 50 shows. We watched how he dealt with an audience. We watched his material. We watched how he set up a start and a middle and an end to the show. We watched sound, we watched the lighting, we listened to the sound, we watched the set, how to get production done, transportation, business. You know, it was like an, uh, a 10 years education uh, crammed into three months. Yeah, you call that the ultimate masterclass, don't you? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You look at some of the great bands, um, and often they're not great friends. You think of, uh, you know, Simon and Garfunkel, you think of the Ramones, you think of the Beach Boys, you even think of, of Pink Floyd. But you guys, I mean, as I understand it, you've virtually never had a crossword in all of these years and truly are from the heart great friends. We, we certainly are. We've never, you know, people won't believe us, but we haven't had an argument. Um, I think the fact that we don't step on each other's toes. I mean, I don't write songs, I can't. He doesn't want to be the lead singer. And I basically understood at the beginning that Air Supply was his vision. We discuss everything. I mean, it's a democracy, certainly. But uh, why fight, you know? And plus, we got into the business when we weren't kids. Yeah. And I think both our upbringings, being in Australia and England, if you kind of got a big head or anything, you know, your family took care of that pretty quickly. And your good friends, because good friends tell you the truth, no matter how hurtful it is. Um, but, you know, it's all been a, a cakewalk for us as far as personalities and getting on to, together. I mean, we, we took trips uh, in the early 80s when we got, it, we got a bit of cash. We'd go to Europe for the weekend or whatever and hang out. Um, I, I can't really explain. It's another, you know, match made in heaven. Yeah. Um, very grateful for it. And we don't uh, see each other when we don't work particularly. He's, he lives in Utah and I'm in Los Angeles. He's like a mountain guy. He's got his own greenhouse and deer and antelope and all that stuff in his yeah. backyard. And I'm, I'm, I like the city. I like being in Los Angeles where it's, you know, you're in amongst pretty much everything. But, you know, if we don't, I think the most we haven't worked in the last two years is probably during the COVID period in 21. Uh, we spoke once a week. Uh, just to catch up, see what was going on and see how everybody was doing. But, uh, you know, I don't, I don't question our friendship or our relationship because it's one of those things. It just is. You know, there's no reason to go, why is it or how, how is it? It just is, you know. But you also have this wonderful kind of chalk and cheese dynamic uh, in that he grows his spinach and his broccoli. <laughs> you love binging on telly and having a glass of wine. I just saw you lifting the glass there, half your luck. <laughs> We don't look the same. He's six foot four and blonde, and I'm not six foot four or blonde. In every uh, incarnation of the band, every band member has his bunch of fans that take to him, you know. Yeah. We never had the same uh, ladies coming after me that were after him, kind of. So there was a definite uh, divide in all those things. And it was, ne you know, we never got jealous of each other about anything because there was no need. Um, and as I said, I can't really explain why it is. And if you, if you on on paper you you put two people together and with all the description of both of them, and handed to somebody and said, "Well, these guys get along," you'd go never in a million years. But uh, here we are. Is this right? Air Supply was doing a concert in I think it was Havana in Cuba in two thousand and five, uh, in the midst of what became a hurricane. That was an amazing experience. It was uh, our first time in Cuba. The entrance to the stage was covered. And uh, so we couldn't see the audience until we got on stage. And it, the rain was very heavy backstage. And we went out to the, to the stage, it was pouring down. There were 175,000 people standing waiting for us. As the night progressed, the storm got worse. And when we went back to the, to the hotel, they came in and boarded up all the windows in all our rooms. Stupidly, I stayed in my room um, and I was there listening to it all. You know, I could peek through the crack in the, in the boarding and I could see cars flying around and palm trees being uprooted. Graham went down into the, to the lobby of the hotel. It was very, um, I think it was called El Presidente. It was a very famous hotel where the likes of Hemingway 
and all the Hollywood movie stars used to say, very solid building. And people from all of the, all the surrounding hotels came and stayed in the lobby uh, for shelter. And I guess Graham did an impromptu concert for those people, which I missed out on. But uh, it was very, very heavy. And of course, the next day to wake up and have them take uh, the hoarding off the off the windows was, it was, you were in a, a war zone, certainly. It was horrible. You think of the impact of your music, Russell. And I mean, you know, Barry White, they talk about him being like the love god. But I mean, you really are the kings of rock and romance. There are people who've fallen pregnant to your songs, yes. people who've given birth to your songs. Yes. Uh, and your music um, is something that really has helped a lot of people learn English in terms of doing karaoke to air supply. That's true, isn't it? Very, very true. We we uh, one of the first bands to go to Southeast Asia. In fact, I think our first date was in South Korea in '82, and we've been going back every year since since then. So we have an amazing following, and as you said, so many people come up to us in the US now and say I learned a lot of my English from listening to your, to your songs. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a lady that just came to a show recently. Uh, we did a, a video special for HBO in 1982. This lady said that when she was giving birth to her baby, she had her, our video playing in the delivery room. But then, I think it was last year, the lady came up and she said, well, I'm the kid of the lady that had your video playing in the delivery room. So that's amazing. We've had people uh, we're contemplating suicide, come to us and say thank you for your inspiration and your music. So, um, you know, it doesn't get any deeper than that, certainly. What must it be like when you hear things like that? You know, our lives are so full of being on the road and and the rest of it that you, you sometimes forget that, that it touches people that deeply um, and for life, you know. Um, we, we have people at shows hold up banners. I saw you in you know, 82 here, I saw you in 90 there. I see, this is my 50th concert. Um, that kind of stuff is is mind blowing and, and very, very, uh, you know, touches your heart very deeply. I guess until COVID came along and kind of changed everything, but you know, you're back into it now. But you guys were doing like 130 concerts a year and absolutely loving it. We started again in January, uh, this year with a couple of shows in Florida and then it kind of kicked in again. But I think since maybe May or something, we've been back to a full schedule. Uh, we have dates booked through next September. Um, as you know, we're coming back to Australia late in the yes, year. Yes, We're doing are. the Philippines, Philippines, Latin America, uh, Singapore. So for your Aussie and New Zealand fans, you guys are headed back this way. Absolutely. Down under. November, Absolutely. December. How exciting for you is that? It is because the visits are few and far between. Um, and with any place that you don't go to for a while, you you don't know how you're going to be received when you go back again. Fortunately, it's always been great for us. But, uh, you know, we're pretty confident that the fans that have seen us before will come back and people that have been exposed to our music for the first time might want to come along and see what all the fuss is about. What can fans expect? I always hate to use the word obviously, but obviously we'll be playing, you know, Lost in Love and Here I Am and Sweet Dreams and and the rest of it. Uh, the band that we have now has a couple of changes since last time, which has made it more dynamic. Certainly mu musicianship-wise is phenomenal. G Graham does a very a cool piece in the middle of the show, solo. We'll probably put, we're trying to get an, a, a couple of new songs worked up for, for this tour, depending on, depending on our schedule and how the recording goes. But, you know, the bottom line is it's 100% energy. Uh, all we can give, we do every night, no matter where we are. And to have, um, you know, the, the, the sense that you're playing in your hometown and you're in your home country and New Zealand is like second home to us. Uh, it's a great thrill for us. Do you personally have a favourite song of all of those songs that you've sung? Is there one for you that really just sticks in your mind and heart? Lost in Love has to be special for me because it was the song that uh, launched our career worldwide. Um, and I, I love to hear that. The response to when we start to play that in the show is always phenomenal. Yeah. Um, people stand up immediately if they're not already. And the other one is All Out of Love because we typically finish the show with that. And it has become an anthem 
for air supply all over the world. Um, it's just a great song. It's very grand um, and people love it to death. I mean, they just, during the show, they every other call out for a song is all out of love. Play all out of love. Yeah. I mean, you, you kind of think about your astonishing trajectory and even coming back from having worked overseas with, with Rod Stewart, I believe you guys were working in a cafe in, in King's Cross and nobody turned up. I mean, incredible. We were proverbially couldn't get arrested when we got back from the trip. In fact, I was behind uh, the doors at immigration in Sydney at the time that kind of opened and you walked out to meet the people that were waiting for you. And I had my bags gone through the whole process and I heard all, heard all these girls screaming like crazy. And I thought, wow, this is amazing, you know. So I opened the door and there's a whole bunch of girls with sherbet uh, flags and... <laughs> So I, I, I crept out quietly <laughs> off to the side. Um, but no, it was, you know, we, we just couldn't, we ended up not playing in Australia after the Rod Stewart tour because we couldn't pay enough money to our band and crew to play. And that's when Graham went to Adelaide. I was, had to stay with, well, I didn't have to, I stayed with my sister and I was doing jingles for, you know, Coca-Cola and Maxwell House and a bunch of things to earn a living. And Graham uh, uh, called me and he said, I've written a few songs. Uh, do you want to come to Adelaide and have a listen? And the first thing he played me was All Out of Love. And um, then he played me The One That You Love. And I said, dude, this is game over. We're back. We got a record deal in Australia with Tony Hogarth at, uh, at Wizard Records. And then um, All Out of Love found its way to Clive Davis in the US. And, uh, you know, he called both of us personally and said, you know, I'm signing you to a record deal. You have to come to America tomorrow and uh, we've got to get this album and the record sorted out. So that's the way it happened. How good would an air supply biopic yeah. be, eh? You should put something together and pitch it, mate. I'm, I'm just thinking, <laughs> Russell, I'm just thinking if only he was musically inclined, Brad Pitt to channel you. I think he needs a new set of contacts or... Uh, <laughs> no, what I need is some of your face furniture, as Dame Edna would say. I look at your khaki <laughs> glasses and I sometimes think you and Elton John could do a fabulous face off, you know. I had this other pair of glasses that are very funky. I wore them all the time a few years ago. Everybody says Elton John that mm -hmm. says you, Elton John. I said, no, I'm not. And uh, I was at an airport flying out internationally and this guy came at me, gave me the death grip handshake, you know. And he said, can I get my picture with you, Elton? And I go, I'm not Elton John. And he said, well, you are. And he wouldn't let my hand go. I said, give me a minute. So I showed him my passport yeah. and I said, I'm not Elton John. And that was that, it, had, it took that to get him to, to let my hand go. And wearing the same glasses in Utah once, the elevator opened and there's a teenage girl there, looked like her late teens, and she, her mouth fell open. She said, uh, are you John Lennon? And I said, well, he's dead, so I guess not. Russell Hitchcock, it's been an absolute joy chatting to you. And I Thanks. must say, cannot wait to see you back in Australia. Uh, you and Graham, total legends. And, I, you know, it must be really lovely to know that your music just lives on and on with such enthusiasm. We said initially when we had success, maybe we'd be good for four or five years in Australia. And that would be it. And... Um, here we are. I, I mean, I can't believe it. And sometimes like places like when you play Cubits, there's that many people that uh, we were the, we were the only act on the bill, like 175,000 people came to see us. Yeah. And it, you get those messages from people that have been in trouble or life threatening situations, situations, and they turn to our music. Uh, that's very, very, uh, I keep using deep because that's about the best word I can use. And it's uh, something. And also, you know, we have, we have a legacy now. I mean, the, the very first record we made, Love and Other Bruises, when we got the first copy of it, which, which is on a 45, and I said to Graham, this is forever. This piece of stuff in different forms is forever. And uh, you can't beat that. Surely there's another album on the way, sure. Oh, yeah. We're working mm -hmm. on it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Russell. It's been a joy. You're welcome, man. Excellent interview, too. Thank you so much.